Uh, it is now time for all questions. The member of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the acting premier. We all know there's money coming in from the Hydro One fire cell, but what we really know is that money is not going for infrastructure. The plan the Premier touts was announced in a budget a full year prior without the sale of Hydro One. It cost $130 billion in 2014. That was the planning for the infrastructure over 10 years. In 2015, it was still $130 billion, not a single cent added for infrastructure. There is no new money. This is a shell game. Mr. Speaker, is the government willing to explain why the infrastructure, government, infrastructure budget hasn't changed by one cent? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Speaker, I am delighted to answer this question, and I have to say I'm a bit surprised by it because we are making a historic investment in infrastructure, and we do have to pay for that infrastructure, Speaker. We've always been very clear that, uh, that the revenue that will pay for the new infrastructure will come from a variety of sources, including maximizing the value of our assets. So I'm very pleased that we've generated almost $3 billion so far on the Hydro One IPO, Speaker. Uh, we will be making other decisions that will pay for the infrastructure that this province so desperately needs. Thank you. Supplementary. Desperate is a good word. Mr. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, even if the government does spend $1.4 billion from the fire sale on infrastructure, it would only account for 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent of the infrastructure budget. This isn't about infrastructure. The FAO actually said it would be cheaper to borrow money, yet the Liberal government plowed ahead with this plan anyways. The Hydro One fire sale, I will repeat, it's not about infrastructure. Order. There is no new infrastructure money. It is a ruse. Mr. Speaker. Stop. Um, I'm hearing it on both sides, and I'm going to have to uh, kind of tighten it up. If you don't do it, I will. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, given there is no changes in the infrastructure budget, will the government be or the government tell the House, no more shell games, no more distractions. Is the money going to pay for your next scandal, or was it the last one? Well, speaker, this is a bizarre line of questioning. We've always been very, very clear. We're committed to making those investments in infrastructure. We're not going to do it by raising taxes, and we're not going to do it by slashing services, Speaker. The way forward that we have chosen to make is to get maximum value from the infrastructure, the assets that we already have. So we will be investing in infrastructure, Speaker, including infrastructure that I think should be very important to the member from Barrie. One of the projects, Speaker, that we will be uh, expanding significantly is the Barry line from 70 trips a week to over 200 trips a week. If the member from Barry doesn't think we should be making this investment for the people of Barry, then I think he's got some explaining to do. Yes, sir. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the acting premier. You know, I get a sense that your own caucus doesn't buy this spin, doesn't buy this, this ridiculous assertion that's for infrastructure. Let me, let me share you a few examples. The member for York West once said, there is nothing the public of Ontario will benefit with from the sale of Hydro One. Right. The member from Peterborough said, yep. we've been pretty clear the Liberals will keep Hydro One in public hands yep. as it should be. The member from St. Catharines is on the record as saying, I think anyone who looks objectively at the Hydro One fire sale would recognize this is best kept in public hands. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier justify having those members in her cabinet publicly disagree with her? And why does she ignore them at the cabinet table? Listen to your own caucus members. <laughs> Thank you. Deputy. Well, Speaker, when it comes to listening to one's caucus, I'm not inclined to take lessons from that member opposite, Speaker. I think uh, our caucus is absolutely committed to building the infrastructure of the future of this province. 
every single one of our caucus members hears from the municipal leaders about the need for investments in infrastructure. When we talk to our municipal councils, when we talk to our business people, Speaker, they are unanimous in saying we need to invest in infrastructure. The party opposite had the chance to invest in infrastructure. They, instead of building infrastructure, they filled in the, the hole that was already being dug for the Eggleton subway. That's their attitude on infrastructure. It sure is not ours. Thank you. Question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Acting Premier, since this government doesn't want to talk why there's no new money for infrastructure, let's talk about the skills mismatch. I know this government is well aware the surplus of young Ontarians graduating from Teachers College. Two graduates for every one job. But their solution for extending Teachers College by a year simply won't make a dent in the larger problem. The amount of new teachers is just one example of the growing skills gap in our province. Two things I hear regularly are that employers can't find qualified candidates, and the young Ontarians don't have the skills for the jobs available today. Young people are forced to leave Ontario because they can't find work because of the skills gap. The gap is even costing Ontario's economy $24.3 billion a year and $3.7 billion in foregone tax revenue. Mr. Speaker, will the government tell us what they're doing Question. to deal with the significant skills mismatch that exists in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you, well, Speaker, we're making the unprecedented investments in skills and trainings, and I have to say, Speaker, that our record on education is an extraordinary record. Even the member of the opposite party, I think, have to acknowledge that when our graduation rate has gone from 68 per cent to 84 per cent for graduation since they were in charge of our education system. Kids are getting an opportunity that they never would have had had they dropped out of high school. Our investments in education are having a profound impact on the success of our young people. We're continuing to make investments. We built a very strong foundation, cleaning up the mess that was left behind by the Conservatives when they had the chance. Thank you. Speaker, I appreciate the Acting Premier answering a different question, so I'll try again and be a bit more specific. While Ontario graduates 4,000 new teachers each year without a job for them after they graduate, you know, I visit places like Cambrian College where there is more jobs available than there is graduates in their power line program. The skill gap exists in this province. It is real. As much as 52 per cent of engineering and infrastructure firms have difficulty hiring someone with the qualifications they need. Employers shouldn't have to go beyond Ontario to find workers, and frankly, young people shouldn't have to leave Ontario to find jobs. Mr. Speaker, can the government outline to us what plans they have to deal with the skills gap? Don't say it doesn't exist. It exists. What are you going to do to solve the problem? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for that question. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to report to the House that our universities and the colleges, they have been doing the best job in the world. We have the best universities, we have the best colleges in the world. And this year, our University of Queen's University produced a Nobel Prize winner in physics. We are very proud of our graduates and around the world, Mr. Speaker, the graduates of our universities and colleges are very well thought of. This is, we have, this is something we have to be very proud of. In relation to the teacher's profession, we are aware of that, and we have now, uh, in the future, the demand and the supply of teachers will be balanced. Of course, uh, during the uh, years when the NDP and the Conservatives, they were in office, Mr. Speaker, there were enormous shortage of teachers. We have met that demand. Now there is a supply and demand uh, discrepancy somehow, but that will Answer. be rectified in the coming years. Thank yeah, you. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the acting premier. Another gap exists in education in Ontario, and that relates to francophone education. Depuis le trois dernier année, le communauté franco-ontarienne m'a dit. The francophone community has told me that we must create a new French language university in Ontario. Throughout Ontario, francophones would like to manage their own university programs with in a university for francophones. As is, and this is the case for school boards and universities. This is why our party is supporting the bill, and we're asking the government to act quickly to support this important project. When will the government respond to the request of the Francophone community and 
commit to establishing this institution. Mr. Speaker, uh, we, we, our government is committed to providing a, a post-secondary education in French language. That's why we have two, univers two bilingual universities in, in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and we have two fully French language uh, colleges in, in our province of Ontario. We are we are committed to providing post-secondary education. Today, Mr. Speaker, there are 22,000 students in our province of Ontario. They receive post-secondary education in French language in our universities and the colleges. And in 2014-15, Mr. Speaker, we invested $90 million to support French language training in our universities and the colleges. Mr. Speaker, I, had a, I am aware of the aspirations and desire of our Francophone community. I have been talking with the student groups, with community groups and we have also established a ministry, uh, advisory committee on French language which uh, the report will be, is due to uh, next March Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. More than 185 municipalities have called on this Premier of our province to keep Hydro One public. But yesterday, every Liberal in the House voted to ignore municipalities. Why is this Liberal government refusing to listen to people everywhere, from Atacokan to Zora, who want the Hydro sell-off stop? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, Speaker, um, I, I must say that uh, everyone from Atacokan to Zora also want uh, investments in infrastructure, and that is exactly what this is about, Speaker. We have assets. We need different kinds of assets for the future. The assets and infrastructure must be built, Speaker. They must be built now. We have a plan to build those and to pay for them. And so, Speaker, municipalities have spoken to every single member of our caucus. I expect every single member in this House has heard from municipalities loud and clear that these investments in infrastructure must be made. They must be made now, Speaker, and that is what we are delivering on. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, over 80 per cent of Ontarians, over 80 per cent of Ontarians want the Premier to keep Hydro One public. But yesterday, every Liberal in the House voted to ignore Ontarians. And trust me, Speaker, Ontarians are going to be hearing about that. Why is this Liberal government refusing to listen to such an overwhelming majority of Ontarians who want the sell-off of Hydro One stopped, Speaker? Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Well, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. You know, it's interesting. I had the uh, I had the privilege to speak yesterday afternoon to the motion that the leader of the NDP is talking about, and in the debate yesterday afternoon or in the discussion, I asked a question of her and her party, uh, which of course didn't get an answer. I guess I would put that question back to her. Given how many, and it's also delightful that she asks about caucus members on this side of the house. Given question how many of her caucus colleagues have significant questions. requests for infrastructure investments in their communities, yeah. whether it's Hamilton or it's London or it's the North or it's Windsor or it's Durham, any of those regions across the or Kitchener, any of those regions across the province want more investments, and I wonder if the leader of the NDP will come clean and tell her caucus colleagues which of their projects would she cancel if she had the choice. Thank you. Final supplementary. Oh, Speaker, businesses know that the Hydro One sell-off is bad for them, but yesterday every Liberal in this House voted to ignore small business, big business, manufacturing, the agricultural industry, the mining industry, you name it, sec uh, Speaker, every one of those sectors does not want to see any more sell-off of Hydro One. Why is this Liberal government? refusing to listen to the job creators in this province. Why are they refusing to listen? Why will they not stop the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I think it's unfortunate that the leader of the NDP has a different perspective on this. What every single member in this government caucus voted for yesterday, Speaker, what we voted for was continuing to build this province up and moving it forward. And specifically, Speaker, we voted for a re-established connecting links fund. We voted for extended go service to Hamilton, specifically to Stony Creek. We voted for two-way all-day go service across all of our seven corridors. We even voted for yesterday the 
the potential to extend GO trains to Niagara region, to support the north, to support the southwest, to support all regions of this province. That's what we voted for. The question is, why won't you? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question? Just hold on. Order. New question. The leader of the Mr. Premier Speaker, but I must say I think it's funny that the Minister of Transportation has no idea that that big list of projects that he just mentioned, each of them will likely cost more than the 1.4 billion they're getting from the sale of the Hydro One. This is a question now to the Acting Premier Speaker that's about integrity and honesty. Just over a year ago. The Premier stood right here in this House in her place, and she said to me, quote, there is not a sell-off of these companies, end quote. But here we are, Speaker. Can the Acting Premier explain why anyone, anyone in this province should trust the current Premier and the current Liberal government? Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to take it, though. It's acting premier. I, I, I apologize. I, I didn't. Um, it's a new question, Speaker. Same question, new question. The answer remains the same, Speaker. We will be raising nine billion dollars through this sale of a par, a portion of Hydro One. That number was confirmed by the Financial Accountability Officer. The, the Leader of the Opposition wants to pretend that that is not the right number, but that is the number that was confirmed by the Financial Accountability Officer. In fact, we have already collected three, almost $3 billion cash in hand received through the IPO speaker. We are going to use that money to pay Answer. down debt and to build badly needed infrastructure. We know the NDP doesn't think that's a good idea. We also know that the NDP Thank has you. no idea how they would pay for it. Supplementary. The question is actually going to the integrity of this government. In October of 2014, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance, who is sitting right there now, looked me in the eye and said, and I quote, we have made it clear that we are not going to sell off our assets. That's what he said in this chamber, in this house. But last week, they issued a press release bragging about the province's sale of Hydro One. It is time, Speaker, for this government to take a step towards reg regaining the trust of the people of this province. Speaker. Will the Liberals stand by their previous commitments and stop any further sell-off of Hydro One or any other revenue-generating asset in this province? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that's interesting. Uh, we have put um, the notion and, and, and the reason as to why we're looking at our assets, all of it for that matter, to do a full review as how to maximize the value for uh, the public and the people of Ontario. Put it in the 2014 budget, which that member didn't even have the decency to respond to or even talk to the press. In fact, they turned their back on Ontarians when they voted it down the second time around, where I had the option and the opportunity to again reinforce the review of our assets, including real estate, including passive shares, including Hydro One. And Mr. Speaker, in the 2015 budget, we reaffirmed the increases on the optimization of those assets, the dedication of increases to the Moving Forward Ontario plan, equivalent to the amount of asset valuation yes, increases, again, to be reinvested dollar for dollar for the people of Ontario and for our future generations, Mr. Speaker. In October of 2014, the, the Premier of this province said here in this House, and I quote, we are not selling off the assets. Put simply, the Premier has broken 
trust with the people of Ontario. She didn't run on selling assets. She promised them thereafter that she wasn't going to sell the assets. And then, Speaker, she proceeded to start selling off the assets of the people of this province. Will the acting Premier show that integrity, keep the promises that the, uh, the Premier and this Liberal government has made, and stop any further sell-off of Hydro One or any other revenue-generating asset that the people of this Question. province own. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we promised that we would increase the valuation of our assets for the benefit of the people of Ontario, and we did that in the IPO for only 15 percent of that transaction, which equated to a net of $3 billion to reinvest in Trillium Trust, to reinvest in, in infrastructure, and an additional billion dollars to pay down debt. But, Mr. Speaker, we said that, and this is what the Leader of the Opposition said in July 6 of 2014, wow. where she read the same budget, apparently, that the, that the rest of us did, and she says this. The budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown Corporation, such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. She said it, Mr. Speaker. We are, we are going forward with maximizing value for the people yes, of Ontario sir. and reinvesting those funds dollar for dollar, as is stipulated in our budget. Thank you. No question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Now, all we've seen from this Liberal government is one scandal after another. The recurring theme is they can never get their stories straight. During the gas plant scandal, they couldn't get their story straight on who paid Peter Feist to delete the files off the government computers. Turns out the taxpayers paid the $10,000. Now the government can't get their story straight on the Sudbury bribery scandal. First, they didn't know who paid Jerry Lougheed's legal bills, then it wasn't the government, and now we know the Liberals paid the bills until he was charged. But the Premier stated that Jerry Lougheed doesn't speak for the Liberal Party. So my question is, uh, Speaker, why did the Liberals pay his legal fees in the first place? Question. Thank you. Speaker, um, the Premier made it very clear yesterday that the government has not paid anything towards the legal bills here, Speaker. Uh, the party is not paying anything, Speaker. This is uh, an issue that's uh, in the courts, and we'll have no further comment on that, Speaker. Give us supplementary. Well, 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 back to the Deputy Premier. The recurring theme with this scandal-plagued government is they can never get their story straight. In the teachers' union scandal, it was a million. It was for pizzas. No, wait, it's three million. It's for negotiating. No, wait, it's for labor peace. Every single day, the story changed. Now, in the Sudbury bribery scandal, it's obvious many Liberals are going to be subpoenaed by the Crown or by Mr. Lougheed's lawyers. They better get their story straight before they swear an oath, Speaker. But I'm curious. Will they be in court standing up for Ontario's taxpayers or for the Liberal Party? My question is, will the Premier and her Deputy Chief of Staff be testifying for the Crown or for the defence? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy. Uh, speaker, we're not going to speculate on an issue that's before the courts. New questions? New questions? The member from Bramble League, Gore Mountain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Canada has promised to welcome 25,000 Syrians, and New Democrats are proud to support this commitment. We are proud to stand with Ontarians to welcome Syrian refugees to our community. It's a part of our strong tradition of respecting the importance of bringing in immigration and standing up for the global community and respecting our, the refugees in our society. But a promise is not enough alone. We also need a plan. This government needs to come forward with a plan to ensure that these people receive the adequate services that they so desperately need. 
What is this government's plan when it comes to housing, support services, language services for these refugees who so desperately need assistance in addition to just promises? Well, uh, Speaker, thank you. Thank you for that question. And uh, I think we are united in the understanding that Ontario is a welcoming place, that we are a place where people from around the world can find a safe haven. I am delighted that Ontario is stepping up to create the conditions for successful integration into our communities from these refugees coming from Syria. We have uh, established a, a group, of, an ad hoc group of ministers, uh, co-chaired by uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. I am honoured to be a member of that committee. I will give the uh, supplementary to the Minister of Health, who can talk about the issues that we are dealing with. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. While I'm encouraged by the fact that our province has made a strong commitment, I'm encouraged by the fact that our country has made a strong commitment. We also need a strong plan to back up this commitment. We need an actual plan with respect to affordable housing to ensure that refugees are housed. We need a, an actual plan to ensure that there's the services, the health services, to ensure that people are adequately taken care of. And we need to ensure that there's language support services. And in addition, we've heard today from a press conference there's a growing backlash against uh, Islamophobia. There's a growing backlash against community members that will be coming in against refugees. We need a provincial strategy to ensure that this is responded to with strong language that we support refugees, that we have a security plan in place. So will the acting premier provide a clear plan that how our province will address all of these important areas so that we can have an Question. actual committed way to bring in these refugees, not just an empty promise. Thank you. Deputy uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we, uh, I think the member opposite realizes that we have yet to get the specific details in terms of the numbers of refugees that will be coming to Ontario, as well as where and when, the timetable. So uh, given that, that we uh, expect in the coming days to receive more detailed information, we are working uh, hard in a coordinated way, not just across government, Mr. Speaker, but with civil society and our many, many partners, whether it's in the education system, housing, settlement agencies that have tremendous expertise in this area, uh, the health care system, where I'm quite frankly amazed at the enthusiasm and confidence that all of these sectors have, that we have the capacity, we'll get the job done. We have a big responsibility, but a tremendous opportunity, particularly at this time of year, Mr. Speaker, to welcome these, as we always, always do, welcome these refugees that come from the most horrible Answer. circumstances, to bring them into the safety and security of this province. We have a committee across government that's working with our partners in civil society and our public institutions to make sure we get the job done right. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. This Sunday, November 22nd, is National Housing Day. National Housing Day recognizes the importance of people having a home to call their own. Our government knows that stable, affordable housing can improve a person's health and the prospects for a good job and education. National Housing Day is an important time to reflect on how much more work we have in front of us because the challenges are real and they are growing. And Mr. Speaker, access to affordable housing is a real issue in my riding of Davenport and one that I often hear about in my constituency office. And as housing costs rise, available affordable housing units decline and wait lists for social housing continue to grow. I know that when I speak to many of the fantastic social housing organizations in Davenport, Question. like Perth Avenue Co-op, Tamil Co-op, they are really feeling the pressure. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is our government responding to the demands of affordable housing in our province? Minister, Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Mr. Speaker, thanks. I appreciate the question, and uh, it's uh, my interest as minister to ensure that affordable housing is understood as a crucial component of social infrastructure. To do that, we're having a number of conversations with the munis municipalities through AMO and other, uh, other vehicles, the private sector, and a number of uh, agencies that uh, uh, are advocates uh, for housing. Uh, I'm proud, uh, Speaker, that our uh, government is committed to the goal of ending homelessness, which we arrived at by working with our expert panel. I'm also proud Ontario is supporting the creation of 
20,000 affordable rental housing units, more than 275,000 repairs and improvements, and providing rental and down payment assistance to over 90,000 households in needs. Um, we're going to work also with a, a federal government, and I look forward to presenting more about our long-term housing strategy Thank you. very soon. Supplement uh, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I know the minister agrees that this year, National Housing Day feels different from past years. Unfortunately, National Housing Day has historically served as a reminder that Canada is the only G8 country that lacks a national housing strategy. While I understand that you and your ministry staff work closely with our municipal partners and local service managers to flow funds from the investment in an affordable housing program, a comprehensive affordable housing strategy in Ontario really requires all levels of government to work collaboratively. Yeah. Now, with the new federal government, there is hope for a renewed and strengthened partnership that goes beyond this commitment to address the growing needs of our province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what does the minister look forward to building with our new federal partners? Well, Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I look forward first and foremost to actually working with the federal government that gets it and is prepared to make a commitment uh, to working not only with Ontario but all the provinces with respect to important issues uh, uh, to them. Uh, we have started conversations uh, and, and we're proceeding uh, with those. The, uh, the feds have made the new, fe the new federal government has made uh, some incredible commitments in the area of social infrastructure and urban infrastructure, uh, something that's, that's new to federal governments and we'll be working with them. Uh, our shared sense of purpose is to achieve a sustainable supply of affordable housing and a Answer. first system of housing assistance for those who need it most. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener-Conestoga. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation Freedom of Information request revealed that not only did this government's Pan Am HOV lanes make motorists stew in hour-long traffic tie-ups that directly led to a 73 percent increase in accidents, but they made motorists pay $3.2 million for that privilege. Minister, how do you justify the spending of $3.2 million on accident inviting slap-and-dash, peel-and-stick HOV lane yeah, stickers? Big success. Real big Thank success. you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Transportation. <laughs> Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I, I thank the uh, the uh, member for that question. Of course, Speaker, as I uh, as I said in media to media yesterday, the uh, transportation plan for the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games uh, had a budget that was estimated uh, to be 61 million dollars. <laughs> and after completing uh, completing the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games, in fact, we came in 23 million dollars below wow. that 61 million. I think it's also it's also important to stress, Speaker, that within that budget of $61 million, we included resources to make sure that we appropriately signed uh, and delineated where the eight temporary HOV lanes would be in place uh, for the game, Speaker. And we were very happy to listen to law enforcement, one of our most important partners in the transportation plan, and that we opened up the temporary HOV lanes for Pan Am, Para Pan Am, well in advance of the games to give motorists and people visiting Answer. an opportunity to become accustomed to the change that would be coming, Speaker. I look forward to following up on this in the uh, supplementary. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, back to the minister. These were temporary lane markings that were quite literally flying away in the wind days after they were applied due to, this, due to the shoddy stick-on plan, and he bills taxpayers $3.2 million. Will the minister at least acknowledge his $3.2 million HOV rollout for the costly traffic tying debacle it was before he doubles down and transform HOVs Don't do into it again. even more costly HOTs. Learn your lesson. Don't do it again. Thank you very much, Speaker. I, I thank the member opposite, of course, for his follow-up. I just want to stress one more time, not sure members on that side of the House and the Conservative Caucus heard exactly what I said in the first round, Speaker, of course, and I, I would only assume that they would want to have an opportunity to stand up and clap for the fact that the transportation budget came in $23 million below the original estimate, Speaker. 
But, Speaker, even more important than that is that member, I think, would know because I believe he actually took the opportunity to attend a number of the venues uh, and see the, sport, uh, see the sporting events that were taking place, Speaker. The most successful Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games in history, Speaker. More than one million tickets sold, Speaker. Uh, we had more than 1.4 million people attend Para Pan Am and Pan Am celebrations at seven sites, including Panamania Live at Nathan Phillips Square and Ontario's Celebration Zone. Speaker. Yes, over the course of both games, more than 31 million Canadians tuned into radio and TV coverage of competition. Speaker, with our Thank transportation you. plan, Speaker, we kept no. the region moving. And the games were Thank you. Uh, we're moving along nicely without some of the little interjections that are taking place. The new question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the acting premier. Every Ontarian pays a debt retirement charge on their electricity bill to pay down the residual stranded debt left over from the old Ontario Hydro. The government keeps the amount of that debt a secret, but we know it was being paid down at a rate of $1.3 billion a year and stood at $2.6 billion in March of 2014. Simple math says that debt should be almost paid off by now. But the Financial Accountability Officer showed that because the government is privatizing Hydro One, the residual stand stranded debt will increase and businesses will have to keep paying $600 million a year in debt retirement charges. Why must Ontario businesses pay $600 million a year to subsidize the government sell-off of Hydro One? Question, thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member will know that we're actually accelerating the removal of the debt retirement charge from businesses, Mr. Speaker, by nine months. He also knows that it's already been accelerated, Mr. Speaker, starting the end of this year for residential homeowners, Mr. Speaker. And he also knows that we've been very, very sensitive to creating mitigation measures for the customers across uh, uh, ratepayers across the well, province, Mr. Speaker. Question. And he knows as well, particularly for businesses, Mr. Speaker, that we've expanded the industrial electricity incentive program, Mr. Speaker, which gives up to 50 percent off their bill, Mr. Wow. Speaker, if they're creating jobs new in the province or expanding their businesses, including businesses right across the province, Mr. Speaker. We've also made available the ICI program, Mr. Speaker, for large industrial producers to many more businesses across the province. Yes, it takes 20 percent off their electricity bill, Mr. Speaker. We're very sensitive. We're very responsive to the business community with respect to rates, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah, and you're still sticking them with an extra 600 million bucks a year for this. At the rate the residual stranded debt was being paid down, it should nearly be paid off by now. But according to the Financial Accountability Officer, by selling Hydro One, the government has made the debt bigger. If the government hadn't privatized Hydro One, it could have eliminated the debt retirement charge for everyone in 2016. Instead, businesses will keep paying $600 million a year until 2018. Why should Ontario businesses keep paying that $600 million for the government's sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Speaker, um, so let's understand what this is. We have a stranded debt, a legacy of the, of the Harris government, which left $21 billion on our books. We have since paid that down, even though the Harris government actually increased the amount of residual stranded debt in that period. It is going down. It has been going down continuously. We have outlined how it is. More recently, a stranded debt of $9.8 billion remains. And currently, we are continuing to pay it. Well, I'll add you to the list of the member from Simcoe Gray, the member from Lanark, and the member from Leeds Grenville come to order. Finish, please. And in fact, the uh, Financial Accountability Officer indicated as a result of the transaction that we're putting forward, we're able to provide an additional amount towards the residual down debt. We are now going to be able to provide certainty to businesses that we're going to do away with the residual strand debt nine months earlier, notwithstanding the fact that strand debt will continue, which will have to continue to be paid down by other sources of a speaker. Yes, but that's the Financial Accountability Officer made it clear that as a result of the way it operates, it's never Thank certain you. as to how much it will be. We're making it certain. Thank you. Your question? The member from BC, BC well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. So on Monday, I had the pleasure of joining the Minister and many other members of this House, including you, Mr. Speaker, 
to raise a flag for the Métis here at the Ontario Legislature in celebration of Louis Riel Day. Speaker, you spoke quite passionately about your her Métis heritage, and you spoke and said you were very proud to call yourself Métis. My good friend Stuart Kiff, who is known to so many of us in the House and is undergoing some personal challenges, is also very proud to call himself Métis. In my own family, my father regularly spoke of Jerry Potts, the great Métis guide who helped lead the CN surveyors across the foothills of the mountains of the Rockies to build the CN Railroad. Minister, in your remarks, or the minister in his remarks on Monday spoke at length about the significance of our government's strong relationship with Métis peoples. Will Question. the minister then, Speaker, tell us more about the significance and what we're doing to support Métis in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Well, I'd like to thank the member from Beaches East York for that question. The Métis are an important part of the richness of Ontario. When we observe Louis Riel Day on November 16th each year, we honour the distinct heritage of Métis communities in Ontario. They are recognized as one of our country's founding peoples and recognized as one of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada by the Constitution Act of 1982. They built a new culture taking the traditions of First Nations and European fur traders to create something unique. Louis Real Day is a time to recognize and respect the history, culture and identity of Métis people. We are grateful for their historic and their ongoing contributions to Ontario and Canada. Well, thank you, Speaker. I know all members of this House would congratulate the Minister on all the great work he's doing forging strong relationships with First Nation peoples in Ontario. And it's great to hear that our government recognizes how significant the culture is of the Métis people to our shared history. And I applaud the Minister for doing such great work building those ties between the government and the Métis peoples. This was certainly reflected in the very warm reception that we all received in the South Lawn on Monday. So the minister is often heard to say that when the Aboriginal peoples of Canada prosper, Ontario prospers. And I'm sure that is especially true and equally true for the Métis people. So, Speaker, will the minister tell us more about what the ministry is doing to create new opportunities for the Métis people in Ontario and our work to promote their distinct Thank you. heritage? Minister. Excellent question. Uh, speaker, last, uh, last year I had the privilege of renewing our government's commitment to the Métis Nation of Ontario by signing a new five-year framework agreement. The agreement sets out how we will work together over the next five years to improve the well-being of Métis children, families and their communities. We will do this by facilitating the recognition and advancement of Métis people in Ontario. We will provide a forum for discussion on matters of mutual concern. We will establish a coordinating committee which will identify priority activities on an annual basis to support the goals and objectives of the new agreement. Together, Speaker, we will continue working to build a successful, compassionate and united province where everyone has the opportunity to connect, contribute and enjoy the highest quality of life. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Foreign Hill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> in honour of today's francophone guests, I'm going to ask my question first in French and then in English. Pour le ministre de la Santé. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, Mr. Speaker, with our growing population and aging population, our health care system in Ontario suffers from a lot of pressure. Could the minister explain how he can provide excellent care to Ontario residents and which they deserve at the same time as he cuts um, doctors' remunerations? The care system is under immense strain. Will the minister please explain how cutting residency spots and slashing physician fees will provide the top-notch health care that Ontario residents need and deserve? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate this question. It gives me the opportunity to uh, speak about this important aspect of ensuring that we have the right mix and supply of physicians uh, in this province to attend to Ontarians' health care needs. And it's important to state clearly that since 2003, we've actually almost doubled the number of residency positions 
four yeah. physicians in this province, from just over 600 to roughly 1,200 today. And as a result of those investments, in fact, we're seeing tremendous progress where this year alone 700 net new doctors will be practicing in this province. And our projections are that that growth rate of new doctors will be at three times the rate of population growth. Yeah. So, but we felt that it was prudent after doubling the number of residency spots in this province Answer. that we actually use science and evidence and health resource modeling to determine what we should do going forward. And I'll speak to that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Le President, Mr. Speaker, could the minister explain how the government will provide good health care for more residents with um, an aging population and facilities that are not pro uh, proper. This government expects to provide health care for more residents, more seniors, and more treatments with an adequate budgetary increase to the global health care budget. And yes, we're seeing an aging population and newer treatments, which it's not just about population growth, it's about those increased costs as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. So so thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just to finish off on the residency spots, so we felt it was prudent through health resource modeling going forward to make sure that we have an adequate number of physicians and specialists that we look at this. And so we've made a modest reduction of less than 5% in the number of spots to because of what we've been told by our epidemiologists and our actuarians and everything to take into account precisely what the member opposite is referring to. But the, the point, Mr. Speaker, is that we are continuing to invest in our health care system. Our health care budget went up this year as it did last year, as it will next year, including the physician services component. We're also investing more in home care, $250 million more that will benefit, generally speaking, Mr. Speaker, our seniors' population. We're continuing to broaden the scope of practice of our health care professionals so that they can do the hard work that they do day in and day out to make sure we're providing that Sir. highest quality of care to our seniors, but to all Ontarians. Thank you. Your question, the Leader of the Third Party. My question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Speaker. The people of Hamilton are worried about a proposal to build a garbage gasification plant using unproven technology on Hamilton's waterfront. But instead of a full environmental assessment, the risky project has only had an environmental screening, a much weaker process intended only for projects that have predictable environmental effects that can be readily mitigated. That's ministry language, Speaker. A year ago, I asked the minister to ensure that Hamiltonians have a full environmental assessment, to ensure them uh, that, uh, that that environmental assessment would take place. A year has passed, and the minister is still waffling over whether to elevate the environmental screening to a full EA. When will this minister finally decide that an experimental project of this nature and scale requires Question. a full environmental assessment? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate the, the member uh, from Hamilton Centre's question. The law of Ontario, and I want to be very clear about this, does not allow, in the case of these types of bump-up requests, any involvement by the minister at all. These are director-level decisions of which I am prohibited from interfering in. There was a huge volume of of activity on this. The ministry received an overwhelming number of, of concerns, I think, uh, articulated by that. I can't prejudice the, pro the process by expressing my views on this particular issue because the director ultimately reports to the deputy minister and I can't interfere in that process. I have been monitoring it very carefully and I am, uh, I am assured by the ministry that they are Answer. Near near making a decision on the bump-up request, and I think I will do my job on behalf of this House to ensure that's not uh, politically interfered Thank you. with and a proper adjudicated due process is taken. Thank you. Supplementary. Government that watered down the requirements for an EA process on energy facilities. This company is gaming the system. They won't apply for an, a, a, a license as a waste facility. Uh, because a waste facility actually requires a full EA. 
but an energy facility does not require a full A. So this minister does have a responsibility to the people of Hamilton to make sure that a full environmental assessment is taking place on this waste facility, Speaker, as it should be. I want to say very clearly that Hamilton City Council has asked for a bump up to a full EA, that the neighbourhood people want a full EA environment. Hamilton has asked for a full EA. I personally have asked the minister to bump this up to a full EA. The bottom line is an independent study showed Question. that the screening process is not adequate for this kind of facility. Will this minister step up to the plate as a minister for environment and climate change and ensure a full EA of this waste facility takes place in Hamilton? Thank you. Minister. You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I have I, I've been here for about five, six years, which probably puts me in the lower 25 percent of members with experience around here. And I would expect that a member who's been here longer than I would know the basic law of this legislature, which she and I have to uphold. What she's asking me to do to tr is, is legally impossible and illegal. If I went to try to bump up this request as and interfere politically in the process, there is no legal basis for that. Wow. Mr. Speaker, I'm accountable to the House to ensure that as a Minister of the Crown, I support the law of the land. As a member of this assembly, I am responsible for being familiar with the law. Answer. Does the NDP want ministers to break the law and politically interfere in independent adjudicated processes of the public service, Mr. Amen. Speaker? Thank you. New question? The member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the minister responsible for women's issues. Last night, I had the pleasure of attending the opening reception for It's Never Okay, the 2015 Provincial Summit on Sexual Violence and Harassment. Mr. Speaker, this was a remarkable event, and I had the opportunity to meet with women and men who are working in the field of sexual violence, not only in Ontario, but in fact from around the world. And it was very encouraging to see colleagues there, including some members of the opposition who were there. Uh, this summit was a commitment that was made in the Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan announced by the minister and the premier in March of this year. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform this house of the goals of this summit? Thank you. Minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the great question and for her hard work on the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment. I was uh, pleased to be with her last night at the opening reception, and I'm glad that she's connected with uh, some familiar folks and some new uh, contacts as well in this sector. And, Speaker, there are well over 600 people at this summit as we, as we stand here today. They're registered to attend the summit. Includes members of our roundtable on violence against women and of our joint working group on violence against Aboriginal women. Also includes, I'm pleased to say, our new federal minister on the status of women, the Honourable Patty Haidu from Thunder Bay. And there are so many more presenters, panelists uh, who are in Toronto for the summit. And Thanks, sir. we have people from across the country, Speaker, and across our nation, uh, including from Ireland and New Zealand. So everyone's gathered together because they Thank share you. a commitment to end sexual violence. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for her answer and for her hard work and that of her staff in putting the summit together. Uh, this summit is an opportunity for people who are working in the sexual violence sector to collaborate and to share best practices with their colleagues. And it's an important opportunity to hear about the innovative work that's going on with these different organizations. I know that many of them, these groups and these individuals, have appeared before the Select Committee on sexual violence and uh, harassment, and they shared compelling testimony with us. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain the outcomes that she hopes to hear from the summit? Thank you, Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for the question. And she's right. Having people together from across the sector to hear the latest research and best practices is an incredible, credible opportunity. We've organized speakers and sessions on best practices to end sexual violence and harassment and to support survivors in the best and most appropriate ways. When the summit is over tomorrow, Speaker, we'll be positioned to continue the important work we've begun with the action plan, working even more closely with our partners in the sector. I want to thank everybody who's attending the summit today and tomorrow. And for those who were not unable, there are webcasts going on simultaneously so people can access the summit. But mainly, I want to thank people for their commitment to ending sexual violence and harassment, whether it's in homes, schools, our communities, or workplaces. Yes, and everyone will go back from the summit, I think, uh, with strength and capabilities and a continued support thank you. Uh, our survivors and victims. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, I've asked yes, about sir. the horrendous murders in Renfrew County far too many times. The Attorney General couldn't say how many offenders are let go when they refuse to sign their probation officers or why Crown attorneys aren't notified when this happens. The families of three innocent women have suffered because of the inadequate support for our eight, over 800 probation and parole officers. The government is far too silent about the gaping holes in our criminal justice system. This week, the minister in the legislature said that he cherishes the work of probation and parole officers, despite the fact that this government won't provide the resources to monitor the 51,000 released offenders. So, Mr. Speaker, um, how can the minister defend his empty words when this government Question. spending on monitoring offenders is the second lowest in the country? Uh, speaker, let me first start uh, by expressing, I think, all of our condolences uh, to the family and friends of the communities uh, that uh, of the of the victims. Uh, uh, speaker, uh, I've said this before: the events that took place in uh, in in Lana County were shocking, brutal, and disturbing. Uh, speaker, as criminal charges have been laid and the police is invest police investigation is continuing, I cannot comment on any details of this case and can only speak more generally. And Speaker, speaker that, that is a point that I think everybody should be quite sensitive about uh, because we want justice to be served and police to be able to complete their work and the investigation uh, that they're doing. Speaker, everybody has the right to Order, feel safe please. in their homes and their communities. Ontario's probation and parole officers are committed to supervising offenders and holding offenders Answer. accountable. There is, Speaker, a comprehensive uh, pre-release planning that is undertaken before an offender is released from a correctional facility. I will provide more details in my supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the question is about saving lives. Uh, what happened in Renfrew County was not just a tragedy, it was the, the depraved violence of a dangerous man. And it just doesn't make any sense why this government couldn't be more vigilant. Uh, we know that probation office orders are enforceable whether or not they're signed, but it scares me to think what will happen when other offenders are let go and the resources for better monitoring just aren't there. Right. Bill 130, introduced by my colleague, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke, is addressing part of that issue, but the fact remains that the likelihood uh, for very high-risk offenders to re-offend is more than 60 per cent. So when will the minister face Ontarians to say that's just not good enough? Finally, start supporting the needs of our probation officers and Question. assessing high-risk offenders before they are released. Please. Speaker, Speaker our, our probation and parole officers. Please, thank you, Minister. Speaker, our probation and parole officers work extremely hard. There is, uh, they develop community supervision plans for offenders that outlines the types of programs and services that are required for their safe safer return to the community. In the community speaker, ongoing monitoring and assessment tools are used to ensure that the offender can be safely managed in the community. And as, as speaker, but I, I fully recognize, I think we all recognize who are in public service, that there's always more work that can be done in reducing probation and parole officer uh, case laws and insu in ensuring that our community is safe. And that is why, Speaker, we are committed to supporting 
our probation and parole officers by working collaboratively through a joint working committee between the ministry and the union that uh, that uh, that uh, represents our Answer. probation and parole officers and their workload. I, I'm personally committed to continue to work and make sure that women and all members of our community are safe thank at you. all times. Thank you. New question, the member from Wyland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Poverty Reduction. Today, a report by an Ontario-wide coalition of over 90 labour and community groups confirms what new Democrats have been warning for years, that Ontario falls last in the pack of provinces when it comes to jobs, social programs, income equality. Ontario families are facing longer wait times for social housing, the highest daycare costs in Canada, seniors still faced some of the lengthiest wait times for long-term care beds, students have the highest debt and the least funding for post-secondary education. What's worse is this government has been in power for 12 years. Speaker, when will this government accept responsibility for its policies and priorities that have left Ontario's most vulnerable behind? Thank you, Minister Responsible for well, Poverty, Speaker, Poverty, Poverty am, Reduction Strategy. Thank you, Speaker. I am enormously proud of the work that we have done so far to address issues of poverty in this province. There is absolutely more to do, and that's why we, by legislation, have an ongoing commitment to poverty reduction. But I do want to remind uh, the House and Ontarians that uh, since the recession, we've created 590,600 jobs. The vast majority of those are full-time, and 77 per cent are in uh, industries that have above-average wages. Speaker. We've indexed minimum wage. We've raised it from $6.85 to $11.25. It's the highest of any province in the country. Speaker. We are looking and taking the, the uh, precarious employment issue very seriously. Order. And that's why our Minister of Labour is leading the Answer. changing workplaces review. Since 2003, social service spending has increased from $8.3 billion to $14.3 billion. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this government's priorities are loud and clear. We have the lowest social program spending per capita in the country. Long-term unemployment is one of the worst in the country. Precarious, low-wage work has ballooned to 8 per cent more than other provinces. Income disparity between the richest and the poorest Canadians has nearly doubled. Instead of focusing, Speaker, on this matter, the government is privatizing our public assets, driving up hydro costs, and continuing to make life unaffordable for Ontario families. Why won't this government admit that after 12 years, it has failed Ontarians who need the help the most? Thank you. Minister. Uh, speaker, we uh, introduced the Ontario Child Benefit. It has gone from zero to $1,336 per child speaker, per year. Our child care funding has, got, has almost doubled. We've introduced full-day kindergarten, so four- and five-year-olds get, uh, get that education speaker, saving families $6,500 a year on child care costs. We've increased st per student funding, Speaker. We're investing more in financial aid. Speaker, this government has done more on poverty reduction work than any government has ever done before. We are committed, we remain committed. We will do more, Speaker, but we must, we must take pride in the work that we have done. Answer. For the member opposite to suggest nothing has happened simply discourages those who are working very, very hard for a better Ontario. Okay. Please. No vote. Please. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.